Hey, McBain, I'm a big fan, but your last movie really sucked. I know. There were script problems from day one. Yeah, I'll say. Magic ticket my ass, McBain. Maria, my mighty heart is breaking. I'll be in the Humvee. In a world overflowing with movies, we need a hero. Someone to separate the bad from the good. Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama episode 107, Last Action Hero. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. And as always, a huge hi and welcome to everyone listening to Verbal Diorama. Whether you are a returning listener or a brand new listener, I am just really happy that you've come back for the sequel. You are a returning listener. And if you are a brand new listener, this is your first foray into the many sequels of Verbal Diorama. Um, And I hope you will go back and listen to some of my other movies as well. It's great that you're here. This is actually the first time I'm going to be talking about an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. It's the first time he's featured on this podcast, which is weird, actually, because I grew up watching his movies. I didn't grow up watching movies like this. I grew up watching movies like Commando. (laughs) So uh, the fact I've chosen one of his less well-received movies is similarly weird, because there's a lot of movies that are actually on my list for Arnold Schwarzenegger that... I haven't done. Instead, I chose Last Action Hero because I have a lot of time for this movie, actually. And other movies of his, they are on my list. You know the ones that I mean. I'm not going to tell you which ones. But all of those really big Arnold Schwarzenegger movies that you love, they are definitely on my list. But before we go into Last Action Hero, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who listened to and provided feedback on Mad Max Fury Road, and the most recent episode on Jaws as well. I mean, there's really no links between Jaws and Last Action Hero, but obviously there are many links to Spielberg's other huge creature-based movie. And as I'm going to talk about in this episode, that particular movie, it has dinosaurs in it, really affected this movie. And when we're talking about Last Action Hero, I mean, this has got serious pedigree. This has got Die Hard's director, it's got Lethal Weapon's writer, it stars one of the biggest action heroes of the 80s and 90s, and it also has a cartoon cat. We're going to come back to the cartoon cat. But basically, this had a formula that should have succeeded. So the question is, what happened to Last Action Hero? And the answer to that is lots. But before we go into it, let's have a listen to the trailer for Last Action Hero. A great classic comes to the screen. Take thy hand, fair prince. Who said I'm fair? To be or not to be? Not to be. Columbia Pictures is proud to present the screen's greatest action hero, Jack Slater. Slater, you hear me? This is the lieutenant governor. Slater, here's what I need. The governor gets here, call me. And Danny Madigan is his biggest fan. <laughs> Jack Slater 4. But tonight, a magic ticket. It's a passport to another world. Will get Danny closer to the action <laughs> than anyone ever dreamed. And you're going with him. Who is this twerk? And where is that smile on his face? I don't even know this kid. To a world that's bigger than life. This ticket is magic, and it really works. And better than real. You really believe that you're inside a movie, don't you? Yes! The bad guys are in there. I've seen it. On screen. Could I speak to the drug dealer of the house, please? 
Have a nice day. Have him killed. This summer, it's head-on thrills. I have killed people smarter and younger than you. Head first, excitement. I hate when it happens. He's got the ticket. Now I possess power, real power. He's gone over to my world. In this world, the bad guys can win. The door must still be open, come on. If I go, how do I get back? And it's coming at you from both sides of the screen. Where am I now? This isn't the movies anymore, Jack. Please be careful. Things were different here. Damn it, it hurt. Arnold Schwarzenegger is Jack Slater. No! This hero stuff has its limits. And Jack Slater is... Everybody down! Now! The last action hero. The big ticket for 93. I'll be back. Ha! You did not gonna say that, did you? That's what you always say. I do? Addicted to the fast, high-octane world of the fictional, no-nonsense Los Angeles cop Jack Slater, portrayed by his favourite idol Arnold Schwarzenegger, film fan Danny Madigan can't wait to see a special preview of Jack Slater 4. With the help of his projectionist friend Nick and Harry Houdini's magical golden ticket, young Danny will soon become a part of the story, living and breathing inside a glossy celluloid world filled with high-speed car chases, magnificent explosions, surreally good-looking women, ruthless Sicilian mobsters and murderous henchmen. However, when a small dose of reality creeps into the fantasy realm and vice versa, the invincible Jack Slater is in for a big surprise – up against is equally indestructible arch enemies in a world he barely recognises. Will the last action hero live up to his reputation? We'll quickly go through the cast. Obviously, obviously, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is in this movie. He stars as Detective Jack Slater. He also stars as himself and he also stars as Hamlet. And the Hamlet scenes are probably some of the best scenes in this entire movie. We also have Austin O'Brien as Danny Madigan, Charles Dance as Benedict, Robert Prosky as Nick, Tom Noonan as the Ripper and also as himself, Frank McRae as Lieutenant Decker, presumably named after Shane Black's friend, director Fred Decker, who also directed The Monster Squad, of course, Anthony Quinn as Vivaldi, Bridget Wilson as Whitney Slater, aka Meredith Caprice, F. Murray Abraham as John Practice, Mercedes Rule as Irene Madigan, Art Carney as Frank Slater, Jack Slater's favourite second cousin, and Professor Toru Tanaka as Vivaldi and Benedict's bodyguard. This would be the final film role for Art Carney and also the final credited role for Professor Toru Tanaka. Also, there are so many cameos in this movie, so let's go through the list of cameos. We have cameos from Tina Turner, Sharon Stone, Robert Patrick, Mike Muscat, Angie Everhart, Maria Shriver, Little Richard, Lisa Gibbons, Jim Belushi, Damon Wayans, Chevy Chase, Jean-Claude Van Damme, MC Hammer, Ian McKellen, Danny DeVito, Joan Plowright, Wilson Phillips, James Cameron, Tony Danza and Sylvester Stallone as The Terminator. The screenplay for Last Action Hero was by Shane Black and David Arnott. The story by Zach Penn and Adam Leff. And it was directed by John McTiernan. So you're probably wondering about the intro to this episode. So that is from The Simpsons, obviously. Season 5, episode 20, which first aired in May 1994. The episode is called The Boy Who Knew Too Much. In it, Bart speaks to Rainier Wolfcastle about the fact his last movie really sucked. And Maya Quimby chimes in about magic tickets. Poor Rainier's mighty heart is broken. And he laments to his wife, Maria, that he'll be in the Humvee. Wolf Castle owns a chain of restaurants called Planet Springfield and he's an action movie star known for his role in the McBain series of movies. I mean, it doesn't really take a genius to realise that Rainier Wolfcastle is modelled on Arnold Schwarzenegger. And The Simpsons' central premise of destroying and embracing genres is what actually inspired co-writer Zach Penn to pen 
excuse the pun, the first draft of what would become Last Action Hero. But it's safe to say what everyone expected Last Action Hero would be, fun, enjoyable to make, successful, it really did not accomplish what was expected of it in pretty much mostly any regard. In 1991, Wesleyan University graduates, Zach Penn and Adam Leff, both huge fans of action movies, wrote a script called Extremely Violent. Their idea was to create an archetypal action movie, but also deconstruct the genre, to make it a modern Wizard of Oz mixed with a reverse Purple Rose of Cairo. What if a teenager got sucked into a silly action movie and uses his knowledge of the genre to subvert all of the action movie cliches? The script for Extremely Violent opens with our action hero, Arno Slater, taking on a team of bad guys in LA's Beverly Center, complete with shopping-based puns. But this is the trailer for the movie within a movie, and the teenage boy watching gets thrown into the movie and has to use the regular action story beats to help Arno Slater become the hero at the end. So the basics of Last Action Hero are, are kind of there, but... What happened to Extremely Violent? I hear you cry. Well, I'm going to tell you. Producer Chris Moore, back then, he was an up-and-coming agent, saw The Wizard of Oz parallels and became an immediate fan of the script for Extremely Violent. And a bidding war erupted on this script, which Columbia Pictures won by shelling out $350,000. And then, just as Zach Penn and Adam Leff were celebrating the fact that their script had been bought by a major studio, which is going to be every young screenwriter's dream, along came Arnold Schwarzenegger, the guy who inspired the character of Arno Slater in the first place. So basically, at this point in time, this was all of their birthdays and Christmases come at once. Not only had they sold their script, they had the interest of the biggest action movie star in Hollywood. And Arnold Schwarzenegger had just starred in the biggest movie of his career, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, and he was weighing up his options for his next project. He was also, and I'm not making this up, considering a movie called Sweet Tooth, in which he would play the Tooth Fairy. And it's not what would become the Dwayne Johnson Tooth Fairy movie either. It is a completely different thing from what I can gather. And when it came to Columbia, I mean, of course, they wanted the biggest action star in the world, to headline this action movie. And they schmoozed Schwarzenegger with lunch in Santa Monica. Schwarzenegger explained he liked the concept for extremely violent, but that, well, it was too extremely violent. He also thought the script wasn't professional enough and wanted to make heavy changes to the tone. So at this point, I bet you're wondering, did Columbia keep Schwarzenegger sweet or did they keep the two graduate screenwriters on board? I mean, it's hardly rocket science, but I'll tell you anyway. So Zach Penn and Adam Luff were booted off their own project. And at Schwarzenegger's request, Columbia hired Shane Black, who is no stranger to this podcast. This is the fourth Shane Black movie that I've featured. And again, not likely to be the last. You'll know from the episode on The Long Kiss Goodnight that Shane Black has a penchant for selling lucrative scripts. He was the go-to screenwriter at the time. His scripts were guaranteed to be made. And Black and Schwarzenegger had worked together on Predator previously. It felt like a no-brainer, but to Penn and Leff, it felt like the rug had been pulled out from under them. The very genre that they were trying to parody was the genre Shane Black was known for writing. And they had also been replaced on the movie that they had actually written. For Shane Black and his writing partner, David Arnott, they were tasked with taking the original script for Extremely Violent and turning it into an action-packed, family-friendly summer tentpole movie. And for a while, they worked diligently and Columbia were happy. But then something changed when Columbia hired John McTiernan. After originally offering the directorial job to Steven Spielberg, who declined to direct Schindler's List instead, John McTiernan was mostly known for his action movies like Die Hard, Predator and The Hunt for Red October. Zach Penn and Adam Leff always envisaged someone like Robert Zemeckis or John Landis directing their movie. Someone with a history of pulling genres apart. But in McTiernan, Columbia had a bonafide action director, and with that came a lot of clout with the studio. The project, now called Last Action Hero, was still struggling to find a consistent tone, and after McTiernan and Schwarzenegger were both reportedly unhappy with the story, both Black and Arnold were then also fired. William Goldman, of The Princess Bride, obviously, was paid $1 million to rewrite the script in four weeks. Carrie Fisher also worked on it, as well as Larry Ferguson, But it seemed like the more money Columbia threw at this script, 
the more convoluted and bloated and problematic it became. Things got so desperate that McTiernan called Shane Black and begged him to return to fix the action sequences, for which Black declined to return. As for which writer got credited for what in the finished product, Leff, Penn, Black and Arnott would eventually go through WGA arbitration to determine credit, and Leff and Penn ended up with a story by credit and Black and Arnott with a screenplay by credit. But while the script may have had its issues, Last Action Hero had pedigree, a great director and the biggest action star in Hollywood, a man who opened up his contact book before it was all in your phone, and Arnold Schwarzenegger contacted friends and former colleagues for cameos in the movie. Schwarzenegger was set to pocket $15 million. The total budget for Last Action Hero was $60 million, which in 1992 was incredibly expensive. And rather hurriedly, plans started to come together. They had a nine and a half month period to shoot and edit the movie, ready for its come what may release date of 18th of June, 1993, as well as arranging lucrative marketing deals with Burger King, Mattel, and a tie-in video game as well. Schwarzenegger, as well as changing the tone of the original script, also vetoed the toys having guns. On the package of the Jack Slater slash Arnold Schwarzenegger toy, it says, play it smart, never play with real guns. So by this point, Last Action Hero has lost four writers, gained an action hero and director, been given a huge budget and a short period in which to achieve greatness, so it's already somewhat set up for failure. Not to mention that the script they had, it wasn't great. So the head of the studio couldn't decide if they wanted an action movie or a family-friendly comedy. Why not both? Seemed to be the only option. They found their exposition kid Danny Madigan in Young Austin O'Brien, and while Alan Rickman was preferred as the typical British villain, they got the cheaper version in Charles Dance, although reportedly Timothy Dalton was originally cast and then replaced. Arnold Schwarzenegger too had approval rights over all major aspects of the production, including the casting, financing and marketing, being executive producer on a picture for the first time. Because of the short schedule, the shoot was punishing, demanding and kind of haphazard actually, if I'm being honest, with McTiernan often struggling with the extreme stress and pressure put upon him by the studio to get this movie made. With the ridiculous time constraints on shooting also came ridiculous time constraints on editing, with only three weeks from the end of filming to when it was set to debut in cinemas, meaning that editing time was minimal. McTiernan even admitted that enormous sequences are literally how they were shot in camera, which kind of explains the copious amount of long shots in the movie, as well as the comparatively bad special effects, especially when compared to a certain behemoth dinosaur movie that came out the week before it. I'm going to come back to Jurassic Park, obviously, a little bit later. And it is unfair to compare Last Action Hero and Jurassic Park, especially considering Last Action Hero feels like a movie that A, just needed a bit more time to gestate, and B, really did seem to come out several years too early for people to fully appreciate the genre it was spoofing, because overall it's not a terrible movie. Action movies are full of ridiculous cliches, and they do take themselves far too seriously. Things like the fact that heroes can't possibly die but other cops can, the loose understanding of physics, the, the fact that hero never misses, and yet, in the case of Last Action Hero, it also has these flashes of dark depravity, Jack Slater 3, the movie obviously, kills Jack Slater's son. And this is despite kids never dying in these movies. Danny and his mother live in a rundown area of New York that's so deprived and crime-ridden that Benedict can shoot someone, shout about it, and nothing happens. No police are called, nothing. A man can be mugged just for his shoes. And this movie has a really deep-seated fascination with those Reebok pump trainers as well. They are everywhere in this movie. I think that's probably more of a product placement thing than anything. I don't know if there's any real deep meaning to shoes in this movie. But Reebok pump trainers are seen on pretty much every character apart from Jack Slater. Danny, home alone, is attacked and threatened with a knife. His father is dead. His mother is a struggling widow. No wonder this kid escapes into movies. No wonder he idolises Jack Slater so much. 
The fact that Benedict understands the corruption and lack of moral values in the real world, and the fact that appeals to his sadistic desires is really just an excuse to let Charles Dance monologue without fear of repercussion. And Charles Dance is really having a great time in this movie, and I love that for him. It's just a shame that the scenes in the real world, and when the movie starts to unravel, actually, despite Jack Slater meeting Arnold Schwarzenegger never not being fun, there are so many plot holes in this movie. One that always stands out to me is, if you saw Arnold Schwarzenegger in New York walking the streets, you would notice him. No one notices Jack Slater walking around and that he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the biggest movie star in the world, except at the movie premiere. And even then, only when the movie wants people to notice that it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, aka Jack Slater. Reportedly, there was a scene where Jack Slater was asked for Arnold Braunschweiger's autograph, but it got cut from the final movie. At least something got cut. Schwarzenegger appears to enjoy lampooning himself and his action career. And in the age of internet fanboys demanding that their movie universes must only have X and they can't possibly have Y and nitpicking every little thing, it's actually, if you think about it, an early smart commentary on the divide between fiction and reality and the blurred lines between them. But then ultimately, at the end of it all, Danny goes back to the real world, Jack goes back to his fake world, and both appreciate their worlds more than they did before, blah, 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 yada, 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 etc, etc. I've got plenty more to say on the many, many plot holes of Last Action Hero, but I feel like I would literally be here forever talking about them. I'll probably talk about a couple more later. But pretty much every single movie before it's released has test screenings. And it's something that I've talked about on this podcast before. Famously, Little Shop of Horrors had a test screening and the audience didn't like the original ending, so they decided to change the ending and they made it worse. I talk about that in the Little Shop of Horrors episode. But in the case of Last Action Hero, this movie is rushing to get finished before the premiere. And so in their infinite wisdom, the studio decided to do a surprise test screening with mere weeks to go. This is on the 1st of May, 1993. It was an incredibly rough screening. The movie was unfinished. It ran 10 minutes longer than the finished product would. And most of the dialogue was incomprehensible. By the end, most of the audience was bored. But the rest of the audience didn't understand what was going on. Why was there a cartoon cat in the Jack Slater universe? Why did some people look like extras out of a bad sci-fi movie? Etc, etc. The reaction was so bad that studio chairman Mark Canton seized the audience comment cards and shredded them rather than let Schwarzenegger or McTiernan see the feedback. When news of the disastrous test screening leaked to the press, because obviously it did, McTiernan and Schwarzenegger arranged an emergency meeting with the studio and requested the release date be pushed back so further changes could be made to the movie. Mark Canton, though, refused that request. They did, however, agree to reshoot the ending, but to the outside world and the press, everything was fine. Mark Canton announced this would be the biggest movie of the year. It was marketed as the big ticket of 93. Huge PR stunts were arranged like the film's name emblazoned on a NASA rocket. This cost $750,000, heralding the first time in history of advertising that a space vehicle has been used to advertise a movie. Ironically, the space launch was delayed until months after the movie released and then was quietly cancelled. Even Schwarzenegger himself bragged at Cannes that he'd made another great movie and the critics had said it was going to be a huge hit. All the while this overhyped PR campaign was going on, behind closed doors, McTiernan and his team were up to their eyeballs in edits, VFX and struggling to get the film finished in time. But then there was the small or large matter of the problem 65 million years in the making looming. But before we talk about that... Let's talk about Keanu Reeves, because what I like to do on this podcast is I like to do something called the obligatory Keanu reference. And this is where I try and link the movie that I'm featuring with Keanu Reeves for no reason other than he is literally the best. And obviously, Keanu is a legitimate action hero, just generally in real life. But in the movies as well, he is also a legitimate action hero. Well, he would become a legitimate action hero when he starred in Speed also as a character called Jack. And obviously the concept of speed is related to Die Hard, which was also John McTiernan's most famous movie. Die Hard is a movie that I am going to feature at some point on this podcast, by the way. I don't know when. It is a Christmas movie, isn't it? Let's be honest. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Let me know if you think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, but I am firmly in the Die Hard being a Christmas movie camp. So 
Last episode, I really struggled to link to Keanu. It was really terrible. How do you link Keanu to Jaws? I feel like I've redeemed myself this episode. Before we go into the marketing push and the eventual release and everything that went wrong for Last Action Hero, let's talk about the music because Arnold Schwarzenegger, as I said, had approval on almost every aspect of the movie. The one thing he really wanted was an iconic song. He personally contacted ACDC, not to use one of their extensive back catalogue of songs, but to write a brand new song for the soundtrack. It's called Big Gun. It reached number one on the US mainstream rock billboard charts and contains very on-the-nose lyrics about Terminators, Uzis and shootouts on the silver screen. Also included on the soundtrack are tracks by Aerosmith, Def Leppard, Alice in Chains and Megadeth. And the soundtrack album was positively received by rock critics. The score for the movie as well was composed by Michael Kamen, but I know what you're here for. You don't want me to talk about the musical the soundtrack of Last Action Hero. You want me to talk about the disastrous release of Last Action Hero. So let's go back. Let's go back to 1991. And let's go back to a movie that I am incredibly fond of and I will not hear anyone slate. And that's Steven Spielberg's Hook. I've done an episode on Hook. It's an episode that I love. And if you've listened to episode 89, you'll know that Hook wasn't the huge hit that people expected, especially not from a director like Steven Spielberg. This is the guy who did Jaws. This is the guy who did Raiders of the Lost Ark. So Hook was a little bit of a disappointment. Not to me, I think Hook is awesome. But basically in the run-up to Jurassic Park, which also had countless production issues, Listen to that episode for more on those. No one really expected Jurassic Park to be a contender. Call it hubris, but Mark Canton was very confident that despite the issues and the late stage finish, Last Action Hero would be more than enough to beat Spielberg's dinosaur movie. And Jurassic Park was due out the week before Last Action Hero. Mark Canton was advised to push the release date back again Bear in mind, he's been asked to do this at this point several times and he refused to do it again. Even though the word of mouth on Jurassic Park was looking really positive, he basically cited that Last Action Hero would lose even more money due to the lucrative summer season for every week of delay than it would if it were released on time. Even Zach Penn wanted to see Jurassic Park more than he wanted to see the actual movie that he partially wrote. This was one studio battle between Columbia and Universal that Columbia was more than likely going to lose. And yet they decided to go ahead anyway and they lost quite spectacularly. After all of this bravado and fake positivity, Last Action Hero was derided by the press. The rivalry became a huge story too. Jurassic Park was cited as the movie of the year. The Jurassic Park merchandise was selling like hotcakes. Kids wanted dinosaur toys. They didn't want an Arnold Schwarzenegger doll advising on the misuse of guns, as well-intentioned as that actually was. Last Action Hero, when it did premiere, was a lavish affair. They recreated Hamlet's Elsinore Castle for the special event. But while special guests were announced on the tannoy system, the event itself was kind of lacking. The attempted burst had died down dramatically and even a huge inflatable Arnold Schwarzenegger did not make it any better. Last Action Hero premiered on the 13th of June 1993 and went on general release on the 18th of June 1993 in the US and predictably opened under Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was number one at the box office. Last Action Hero came in at number two. It earned $40 million less than Jurassic Park in its first week. Jurassic Park would continue to dominate with Last Action Hero dropping to fourth place in its second week when Sleepless in Seattle and Dennis the Menace were released. Even a re-release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in its third week did better than Last Action Hero did. So Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came in at number five that week. Last Action Hero dropped to seventh. The negativity for Last Action Hero just never died down. And the so-called next big summer blockbuster slowly disappeared from cinema screens. It wasn't a complete financial disaster. It would end up making $137.3 million worldwide on its $85 million budget. 
but the declared financial loss was $26 million after you take into account all of the marketing costs, etc. This was a really expensively marketed movie. This whole situation about Last Action Hero would deeply affect Arnold Schwarzenegger for some time after. He really felt this on a personal level. He really believed in the movie and he believed in what they were doing. And perhaps everyone working on the movie needed less of the hubris, Arnold included. Even now, he acknowledges that everyone did their best on this movie, that they did want to appeal to both action and comedy fans, but ultimately appealed to neither. And Jurassic Park really did seal its inevitable doom. John McTiernan too struggled with the disappointing returns, but at least there were no hard feelings when it came to Shane Black, because Shane Black went out for a beer with Arnold Schwarzenegger and John McTiernan after the movie's release, and basically consoled each other over the disappointing returns of the movie. Because basically, and I can't stress this enough, it's not a terrible movie. I enjoy this movie a lot. I have a lot of time for this movie. I have seen this movie twice this year. I watched it for the podcast, but I also watched it a couple of months back. And yes, it is very bloated and it is very uneven, but there is a lot of great stuff in this movie. And critically, most of critics agreed, and they, well, obviously, I'm not a critic, but they kind of agreed with that summary, that it had all the right ingredients there, but an uneven tone and structure makes it a bit of a mess. And the way I look at it is you can have the right ingredients for a cake, but if you don't mix them and bake it properly, you just end up with a bowl of flour, sugar, eggs and butter. Last Action Hero has the best eggs, flour, sugar and butter in the business, but it's not a very well mixed or baked cake. It's basically just putting a bowl of all of those ingredients in the oven and expecting a cake at the end. That's probably a really bad analogy, but it's the best analogy I can think of to describe this movie is that it just needed a little bit more time and a little bit more care, a little bit more mix, a little bit more mixing and a little bit more baking. And I really do think this movie could have been something really special. At the infamous Golden Raspberries, Last Action Hero was nominated for six awards, Worst Picture, Worst Actor for Arnold Schwarzenegger, Worst Director, Worst Screenplay, Worst New Star for Austin O'Brien, and Worst Original Song for Big Gun, but it came away empty-handed on all counts. It would also garner two Stinkers Bad Movie Awards nominations too, for Worst Picture and Worst Actor for Schwarzenegger, but it's not all bad news for Last Action Hero because it did also get nominated for six Saturn Awards for Best Fantasy Film, Best Actor, Best Director, Best Performance by a Young Actor, Best Costume and Best Special Effects. Unfortunately, it didn't win any of those, but you've got to kind of take the rough with the smooth. Yes, it got some Golden Raspberry nominations, but it's okay because it did get some Saturn nominations as well. And, you know, it didn't win any Golden Raspberries and it didn't win Stinker's Bad Movie Awards. So it can't be that bad, right? I feel like I feel like I'm trying to convince everyone listening that this is not a bad movie, but it's really not a bad movie. Let's segue into social media thoughts and let's have a listen to firstly what the patrons of Verbal Diorama think of this movie. And we're going to start with Luke. And Luke says, Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I still use this line to pretend I'm listening to someone talking and it's all thanks to Last Action Hero. It's such an underrated film, can't wait to hear your thoughts. To be honest, Luke, I just hope you don't do that to your ex-wife. And we have perennial commenter Andy, and he says, This is definitely a film that benefits from a decades past rewatch. Having seen it on opening night, it came across as someone's attempt to parody a genre that was already, at this point, a parody of itself. A lot of the jokes were falling flat and it really came across as trying too hard to be something different. Fast forward 28 years, upon rewatch there's a charm to this movie, especially in Schwarzenegger's performance that can't be denied. It's by no means a perfect movie though. In a year where Jurassic Park was wowing us with cutting edge CGI, the effects in Last Action Hero were weak, even for the time. There are also issues with how the rules of this universe work. In short, if an animated cat never appeared in any Jack Slater feature, then why would an animated cat show up in this universe? If the universe is contained within the realm of this one movie, then there's Danny, the walking exposition machine whose only job in this film is to point and say, X happened because X always happens in the movies. 
with the expectation be that you, the audience, says to yourself, yeah, X does always happen in the movies. It definitely has its nostalgic charm and has earned its place in the golden annals of junk food cinema. You'll know by now that Andy is one of the hosts of the excellent podcast Geek Salad. I know that they have done a YouTube retro review on this particular movie. I will find it, I will link to it in the show notes. But otherwise, Geek Salad it is basically a one-stop podcasting shop for all of your geeky movies, music, TV, games, etc. News and reviews and ideas and lists and summaries and all sorts of brilliant things. I am going to be on their podcast very soon. I don't know exactly when. I think it might be next weekend or it might be this week actually as this podcast is being released because I obviously record these in advance. I don't know but check out Geek Salad and you might find me (laughs) but otherwise you will find literally hundreds of excellent episodes from them so make sure that you check out Geek Salad. And comments from hosts of Geek Salad are a bit like buses because One comes along and then another one comes along straight after. So we've also got a comment from Mike, who's also one of the hosts of Geek Salad. And he said, Could have been a fun movie, but it takes the self-parody too far. A cartoon cat, a black and white Humphrey Bogart and a cop in an S&M outfit? Too much. They could have dumped the real world plot and it would have been a better movie. Good thing Arnold is likeable. And I'm not going to do another plug for Geek Salad because I've just done one. (laughs) <laughs> so we're going to move over to Twitter not very many comments over on Twitter but you know not really unexpected for a movie like this to be honest because I don't think people remember this movie very fondly we're going to start with at stuntgoat75 who said very underrated it suffered coming out the same summer as Jurassic Park it's still funny Arnie is on good form and Charles Dance constantly annoyed villain is both amusing but sinister at Cherry Bombs Pod said, I was absolutely convinced this was going to bury Jurassic Park at the box office in 93. I was so determined to love this movie that I saw it three times opening day. I still rewatch it every couple of years, hoping it finally clicks for me. And at James Rowling said, I think this film is a victim of being a bit too original for its time. If it was released now, I think it'd do much better. Arnold is on top form and shows how self-aware he is by continually sending himself up particularly in the fantastic version of Hamlet. Love it. And James, I actually am in agreement with you on this because I feel like this is a sort of movie that I think would have done a lot better had it come out in recent years. It would definitely benefit from some serious rewrites to the script and to the plot, but it is incredibly self-aware and it really kind of is, unlike most of the stuff that was coming out in the 90s. So I'm kind of in agreement. I feel like this is very akin to something like Mystery Men. Mystery Men didn't do very well either, but that was incredibly self-aware and a parody of the superhero genre. And this is a parody of the action genre. But parodies only really work when they come out at the right time. And so, like with Mystery Men, it feels like Last Action Hero has suffered, not just from Jurassic Park, but from the fact that it just didn't come out at the right time. So yeah, in in agreement with you on that. No comments on Instagram or Facebook. We're not going to get as many comments on Last Action Hero as we did on something like Jaws, but as always, a huge thank you to everyone who took the time to provide some comments on Last Action Hero. And basically, general consensus, it's not great, but it's all right. (laughs) I think is what we're saying about Last Action Hero. Uh, Arnie's great, Charles Dance is great, but don't look into this movie too much because once you start picking at that thread, it all unravels quite quickly, unfortunately. I know I've said it a couple of times, but I genuinely feel there is a great movie in Last Action Hero. A genre parody before the likes of Edgar Wright's Three Flavours Cornetto trilogy would so successfully achieve that mix, and especially the likes of Hot Fuzz, who obviously took on the action buddy cop movie so spectacularly. So many issues were present in the production of Last Action Hero, but I have to believe it could have been successful. Because there is a lot to enjoy in this movie, especially Arnold Schwarzenegger, who seems to enjoy his comedy roles more than his action roles. In fact, he did comment in an interview that his favourite movies that he's ever done are Twins and Junior. He seems to clearly relish the opportunity to play against type. And you know what? He's good at it as well. But without having those action roles in his early career, Last Action Hero wouldn't be able to send them up. If you think too much about Last Action Hero's plot, 
the massive holes start to threaten your enjoyment. So really, it is a movie that's best enjoyed with your brain switched off. Saying that, it does have sparks of really fascinating stuff. Things like postmodernism, existentialism, things like if I'm just a character in a movie, then who am I? Am I just an extension of the actor or am I a person in my own right who inhabits my own world? Would the death of Arnold Schwarzenegger essentially kill this entire world? Would it also affect movies like Basic Instinct and Amadeus? If Sylvester Stallone starred in this universe's version of Terminator 2, does that mean that Robert Patrick didn't? And if so, why is he the T-1000 in this movie? Why is he even in the Last Action Hero universe? Why do the rules of the ticket not make sense? Why does the Seventh Seal fictional version of death know about real life Danny Madigan's death? Because he's fictional. Why is there a cartoon cat, really? You basically keep going through these questions and you spiral into ludicrous mediocrity. I swear though, there is a good movie in here and it's a movie I do enjoy watching despite all of the above. Chances are, even if it had been delayed, it still wouldn't have done great business. But like most things, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Jurassic Park was a huge movie. It's still one of the biggest of all time. Nothing stood a chance against it, especially in a movie touted as the next great summer action movie. The production really did cut off its nose to spite its face with all the fake positive PR. I get you want to tell people that you're great. I have a podcast. I can't go around telling people my episodes are rubbish. But similarly, I don't tell people that I'm the podcast of the summer because you need to balance it out. And honestly, you can't be arrogant about it. <laughs> Even if I thought I had the greatest podcast ever, you don't really go around and say you've got the greatest podcast ever. I, I will add that I don't think I've got the greatest podcast ever. You can't say that you're awesome. You can't say that you're rubbish. Just say that you're okay. If Last Action Hero had done that, it might have fared a little bit better. You know, don't big yourself up too much. Just say, yeah, we made a movie. We think it's going to do really well. Don't say, this is the big ticket of 93. This is the greatest summer blockbuster ever. Because chances are, you're going to go up against a movie like Jurassic Park. Like me. <laughs> With my little podcast going up against some huge behemoth of a podcast. I know that I would stand no chance. So you just got to be a little bit humble sometimes. Movie studios, be a bit more humble about your movies. But I digress. If you've not seen this movie in a while, which I expect a lot of people haven't, it's definitely worth looking into watching. It's on Amazon Prime Video here in the UK, so check it out if you can. When you realise that this movie is practically unedited, with a lot of unfinished effects, clearly, it makes a lot of sense re-watching it now. Given a bit of time and fine-tuning, this movie has so much potential. It's ironic though that Jack Slater's catchphrase is big mistake because Last Action Hero made a few too many of those. Thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Last Action Hero. If you love this episode, you can help Verbal Diorama grow and be noticed by others by telling someone about this podcast, especially if they enjoy Last Action Hero. Maybe they didn't know about the production issues. I certainly didn't know too much about the production of this movie. I found out so much interesting stuff. So yeah, make sure you tell someone about this podcast, a friend or a family member. You can leave a rating or review on something like Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And you can also go on social media and you can like and retweet posts on things like Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And I'll let you know my social media handles in a little bit. Another thing I like to do is I like to recommend other episodes that you might like. So if you did like this move, if you did like this episode, you might also like one of the following episodes. So of course, I'm going to suggest episode eight, which is on speed. Now, this episode is an early episode. It's a guest episode. It co-stars Kristen from So I'm Watching This Show. We had an amazing time talking. She is so lovely and amazing. She's also a patron as well. And Kristen and I talked for a lot about speed. And... It's quite a long episode, which is ironic considering it's a movie called Speed. It is an extra long episode. <laughs> I don't apologise for that because it's about Keanu. But obviously, Speed is, I think, one of the best action movies ever made. So obviously, if you like Last Action Hero, you will probably like Speed. 
Obviously, I can't not mention episode 57, Jurassic Park, mainly because it basically hammered this movie, didn't it? But Jurassic Park was the king of the cinema in 1993. Last Action Hero stood no chance against it. But it's also a movie that's not without its problems. And unlike Last Action Hero and its problems, Jurassic Park found a way, so to speak. <laughs> it found a way to become the biggest movie of 1993 and one of the biggest movies of all time. So absolutely listen to the episode on Jurassic Park. I also wanted to recommend a couple of Shane Black movies. And so I went with the episode 88, The Long Kiss Goodnight, because when we talk about Shane Black and we talk about action movies, it is one of the best action movies of the 90s by far. It's so underrated. It's incredibly fun. Gina Davis, Samuel L. Jackson. It's so witty and smart and it's ridiculous, like completely ridiculous, but a lot of fun to watch. And again, completely underrated. So if you haven't seen The Long Kiss Goodnight, please go and find that and check it out. And episode 96, The Monster Squad, just cause... <laughs> more people need to watch the monster squad it's got nothing to do with last action hero other than it also stars young kids slash teenage boys but other than that it's another shane black movie directed by fred decker like i say who i believe is the namesake for lieutenant decker i don't know that for certain i'm just guessing the partnership of black and decker as i called them in that episode is one of my faves and the monster squad is a super fun movie and yeah, I think it's better than The Goonies. So uh, yeah, I know that's controversial, but I mean, it's controversial that this was the first Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that I did and it wasn't Twins or Terminator 2 <laughs> or Predator or any of those awesome Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I chose to do Last Action Hero because, you know, I like to keep things fresh. I like to mix it up. What are we doing for the next episode? Oh, give me feedback, by the way on episode recommendations. So next episode, I, I kind of teased this in the previous episode on Jaws. And I basically said that it was Jaws in space. And I mean, that is probably the hugest clue because there's really only one movie that's Jaws in space. And that is Alien. Interestingly as well, I just recently rewatched Alien Resurrection, which is a movie that I actually find quite memorable. I don't enjoy it. That's a weird thing to say. I find it memorable. And again, I think there's a lot of potential for Alien Resurrection. But I'm very excited to go back to where it all started, to the movie that introduced us to Ellen Ripley in the first place, to the movie that has that gorgeous minimalist poster for Alien, the music, and basically the start of this franchise is still going today, you know, in the form of spin-offs. And I believe there's a TV show coming linked to this world as well. So join me next week when I'm going to be talking about Alien. And I'm really, really excited to talk about Alien. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to follow me on social media, you can do so. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd at Verbal Diorama. If you want to support the show financially, which you're under no obligation to do so, by the way, but if you do, go to verbaldiorama.com slash Patreon. And as always, a huge thank you to the patrons of Verbal Diorama. They are Simon E, Sade, Hardy L, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Jason, Kristen, Kat, Andy, Mike, Griff, Luke, Emily, Michael, Scott, Mark, Brendan, Ian, Lisa, Dan, and Sam. If God was a patron, he'd be those guys. I do have a merch store, which is verbaldiorama.com slash merch, but no one really cares about that. <laughs> If you want to get in touch with me, you can email me verbaldiorama at gmail.com or you can go over to verbaldiorama.com. You can also catch up on episodes and stuff on the website too. But if you scroll down, there's a little contact form. And you can also pop over to Film Stories. You can check out the magazine that I write for and online articles that I write as well. And you should always support independent publications. And finally, I'll be back. Ha! You didn't know I was going to say that, did you? Bye.